Gresham College presents Trading Places and Travelling Musical Legacies of the Hanseatic League by Dr. Geoffrey Weber. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here in Gresham College. Most days at work, I pass a portrait of Thomas Gresham as he was a student at uh, Gonville and Keys College. Um, after 400 years, the college has almost forgiven him for not leaving any of his substantial wealth to the college, but he did at, le at least leave his money to education, that's why we're here today. So, um, Trading Places and Travelling, Musical Legacies of the Hanseatic League. I'd like to begin with some maps. When I first began studying German music of the 17th century, I remember starting with a map of Germany and locating where everyone that I knew about actually worked. Now, back in 1980, that was, of course, the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic, West and East Germany. But before long, I discovered that even putting these two countries together was far from adequate, with several important German composers turning up as far east as what is uh, as Russia. To understand the extent of that great federation or association of towns and cities known as the Hanseatic League, one's geographical view of Northern Europe needs to be dominated by the principal trading sea routes. It was essentially the movement of goods by sea that brought these towns and cities together during the Middle Ages. And thus the most effective maps of the trading area are those in which the sea is at the center. This map shows the extent of the Hansa, as it's called, in about 1400, centered around the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. The area stretches from London in the west to Novgorod in the east, with Bergen in Norway, the most northerly outpost. This map shows a slightly wider area and crucially has lots of lines showing the actual trading routes linking all the ports together and then continuing onwards inland to nearby cities and towns that were also part of the League. Now the East Anglian town of Lynn, like uh, London, uh, was an important port in the Middle Ages and a few years ago, uh, Kings Lynn held a special festival celebrating its links with the Hanseatic League, uh, rather like the current uh, City of London Festival, during which a replica of a German trading boat, the Lisa von Lübeck, sailed to the port as shown in the picture on the right. The town still has a warehouse shown here that survives from the heyday of the League built in a characteristic red brick that dominates the churches, town halls, and town gates of the region. Another lecture would deal properly with the architectural legacy of the Hanseatic League, but I just happened to be in Worksop College, a school in Nottinghamshire, early this year, and was completely taken aback by the presence of red brick Hanseatic architecture in the main school building on a scale very similar to the buildings of the late Middle Ages. Now, this is a painting of the Port of Lübeck, a modern painting of the Port of Lübeck, as it may appear to, uh, have appeared in the mid-14th century. And you can clearly see the characteristic Hanseatic stepped gables in an overall circumflex shape on the top of the buildings in red brick. This is the same view today, with a ring round those stepped gables, which is so characteristic of the style. Um, and then here is Worksop College, which has the step gables both along the, the sides of the hall and, as you can see, just at both ends. But this isn't a lecture about architecture, this is about music. But first, back to the maps. Now, this one is very special. There's so much there you can't see it all, um, but I will go in shortly. This map dates from 1539. It was produced by the Swede, Oleus Magnus, and his Carta Marina is headed a description of the northern lands and of their marvels. It was designed to impress the people of southern Europe, principally Italy, who had never been this far north. 
Magnus's map naturally places Sweden firmly in the middle, and he's keen to include as much northerly land as possible. Magnus includes many different aspects of life, producing an entertaining and informative map that more than makes up for its comparative lack of accuracy in terms of modern geography. It shows much wildlife and a notably large number of ships, emphasizing the vital trading routes of the time, together with types of fish, sea currents, shipbuilding yards, etc. Now, in the first close up, you can see Iceland. And you can see the volcanoes rather splendidly shown in the circles. Uh, and just below, slightly more relevant, um, I've ringed a battle between two ships on the left. Can you see the cannonballs flying and men jumping overboard? Um, it's noted as a Hamburg ship attacking a Scottish vessel. And on the right, an encounter uh, with whales by a Lübeck ship. Uh, which loses much of its precious cargo. More of Wales later. So does music make an appearance on the map? Uh, well, yes, it does, if only at the outermost reaches of the map, where Magnus may have been struggling for things to portray. But we do have here Iceland's premier gamba player entertaining the local wildlife. and some dancing to cymbals in northern Sweden. But before we leave the splendid map, we must have a look at the two cities on which I will mostly focus in this lecture, Hamburg and Lübeck, both ringed here. Hamburg on the left, Lübeck on the right. Lübeck was for many years the chief city of the Hanseatic League, even more important than Hamburg, and although their relative importance in today's world is drastically different, they are both great centers of commerce, art, architecture, and of course music in the early modern period. There are two things I'd like you to spot just south of Hamburg and Lübeck on the map. The first, on the left, is the town, which you will see has the same name as one of the greatest mid baroque composers, Dietrich Buxtehude just to the south of Hamburg. You can find the word Buxtehude in a modern German dictionary, since there is a derogatory expression used by those living in Hamburg, oh, he comes from Buxtehude, which could be translated as he comes from the back of beyond or the sticks. But this is indeed the town, uh, which was a Hanseatic town in its own right during the early modern period that Buxtehude's family originally came from. And secondly, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the mention in Latin of what was crucial to the wealth of this region. Just near Lüneburg, where J.S. Bach was a chorister, we can see hic fit candidissimus sal. Here is made the whitest salt. This commodity was one of the most important products on which the wealth of Lübeck was based as so much of the salt from Lüneburg was distributed via the port of Lübeck. <coughs> so what can be said of the musical legacy of this great trading area? In essence, we are looking at travel and money. The main trading routes allowed ease of travel around the region, and the wealth of the main towns and cities enable the finer things of life, including, of course, music, to flourish. In fact, much of the cultural life of the time took place within the realm of the nobility in the prestigious courts of the region, but much also prospered in the towns, especially those at the heart of the Hanseatic League. Unfortunately, we know comparatively little about the music of the earlier and greatest period of the League during the High Middle Ages, but of the music in the final years of the League and around its final demise in 1669, we know a great deal. Musicians obviously had to travel in search of both education and employment, and in the 17th century there were two clear routes, either east-west along the trading lines of the Hanseatic League or north-south to Italy. The latter route to Italy is not of relevance to today's lecture, 
but was perhaps the most important at the time from the perspective of musical style. But a crucial early example of the east-west axis in the 17th century can be found in the form of the so-called North German organ school. This was led not by a German, but a Dutchman, the organist Svelink, who worked in Amsterdam. And his German pupils traveled from Hamburg and North, Northern Germany, either overland or by sea, to study with him. Svelink's most important German pupils were Jakob Praetorius, Heinrich Scheidemann, and Samuel Scheidt. Scheidt and Svelink both featured in a concert given earlier in the current festival by the BBC Singers and Ian Farrington at uh, St. Giles Cripplegate. But thinking of the eastern side of the Hanseatic League, the career of the composer Johann Mader provides perhaps the best example of the way top musicians travelled around the, the towns and cities of the League. Johann Mader came, in fact, from central Germany, and he studied in Leipzig. But his career started him um, here, right at the bottom left in Bremen, um, another of the most important uh, Hansa cities. Uh, then he went to Hamburg, uh, Copenhagen, Lübeck, and then, see if you can spot where, the, uh, where he goes, uh, all the way to Reval, which is now Tallinn in Estonia, then to Riga, then uh, Danzig, or uh, Gdansk now in Poland, then he went to Königsberg, that's now Kaliningrad, the Russian naval port, and finally back to Riga where he died. One of his surviving motets was composed to mark the liberation of the city of Riga from a Muscovite siege. You can see this Russian threat even in the 1539 map. We'll go back to that. On the left, you can see the city of Riga circled in red. And on the right, circled in black, a row of cannons facing the threat from the east. This is the title page of the motet, and a close-up of the bottom left-hand side um, is the crucial detail. This reads, Riga, uh, 3rd of October 1684, for a Thanksgiving feast celebrating the liberation of the city from the Muscovite siege. And below that, the interesting tag, um, also applicable to Germany uh, and Sweden, added afterwards, it seems. Early in the 17th century, even English musicians occasionally found their way around the Hanseatic ports and cities, especially if they were viol players, since English viol playing was highly regarded at this time. William Braid is uh, the obvious example, and he worked in a multitude of courts and towns within this area. Braid worked in Hamburg in the first decade of the 17th century, serving as an official town musician, and some of his music was published there in 1607. After a brief period of court employment, he returned as the principal string player of the city in 1613, with a good salary and the opportunity to play for lots of uh, important occasions and earn extra money. Braid had, in fact, tried to raise his salary at the court by threatening to return to Hamburg, and the Count instructed his lawyers to inform the city that he was a mischievous, wanton fellow, clearly trying to keep hold of his good musician. The impression we have today of the geographical spread of German culture in the early modern period is naturally colored by the political and military events of the 19th and 20th centuries. But when assessing German music of the 17th century, this full east-west axis of the Hanseatic League needs to be taken into account since so many German-speaking citizens were found throughout the region. Indeed, one of the interesting aspects of our knowledge of German Baroque music in general is that it has inevitably been shaped by the work of post-war German scholars who understandably tended to favour those composers who worked in the western part of the region, such as Buxtehude, Tunda and Bernhardt. Many other German composers who worked in the area covered by the former DDR or further east in what is now Poland, the Baltic States and Russia have received much less attention 
due to the various political sensitivities involved in relation to the German Reich. The situation is gradually changing, but still excellent composers like Mader, who I've already mentioned, and others like Kaspar Förster and Balthasar Erben, both of whom worked in uh, Danzig or Gdansk, are still waiting to be fully rediscovered. So whilst the musical legacy of the Hanseatic League clearly rested considerably on the ease of movement between towns and cities across the region, the principal boon to music and musicians was the League's prosperity and wealth. Let us return briefly to the North German organ school. Not uh, today to the organ music, but to the instruments themselves. Since they were amongst the most complex machines of any sort being made at this time, being marvels of engineering, acoustic design, metalwork, woodwork, and more besides. The larger organs of the region were musical resources that went far beyond the strict necessities of the regular liturgy of the church. True, the churches were often big spaces that needed to be filled with lots of sound, but what is striking about many of the organs is the duplication of stops of a similar nature that weren't designed to be used together, but were simply there as luxury alternatives. The organs frequently possessed impressive and ornate facades with highly decorated pipework, and they often had what are generally called toy stops. Here's one of the few original facades that escaped Allied bombing in the war at St. Jacob's Church in Lübeck. Here's a close-up of the case in which you can see the painted pipes and other decorative features. This next organ was built by perhaps the most famous builder of the period, Arp Schnitger, uh, and originally stood in one of the Hamburg churches. At the top of the case is an example of one of these toy stops, so-called Simbelstern. Positioned at the top of the case, uh, it provided visual as well as oral entertainment as the device whirled around to create the bell-like effect. Other toy stops of the time included the drum, which was... Uh, two large uh, organ pipes that were carefully positioned so that their mouths faced each other, creating a rapid beating sound due to the resulting air turbulence. It does work, I have heard it. Um, and the birdsong stop, uh, which was often a small pipe placed in water. My first encounter with one of these was back in the days of East Germany. and I, I visited Stralsund um, to visit this absolutely magnificent instrument built in 1659, um, and it has one of these bird stops, but it was in January and it was so cold that the water had frozen. And the gallant local organist offered to go and boil a kettle and come back and see if he could unfreeze the water for me, but I was too worried about damage to the pipes. In the larger cities, churches would try to outdo each other with bigger and more extravagant organs, sometimes with four keyboards and pedal pipes up to 32 feet in length. And delicate negotiations were often needed between the trading guilds since organ builders needed a multitude of different materials from which to create their wonderful instruments. This rivalry imitated the one-upmanship that also existed between uh, the local uh, noble families. The, the German historian Gisela Jax has written that, on the whole, the rivalry between the parish churches for the biggest and best organ not only in Hamburg, but also in Lübeck or Lüneburg, is strongly redolent of the way the local princes vied with each other in displaying their prestige. Gisela Jax also provides a nice parallel with the world of gardening. The influential poet and pastor Johann Rist, whose hymns were set by Bach, wrote as follows. Some say, I have been at the court of a great potentate, and there I saw an uncommonly beautiful royal garden. But how's that? If it do please you to admire a garden as has royal beauty, then come to Hamburg, where they will show you not one, not five, not ten, nay, thirty, forty, fifty, which are almost, nay, wholly equal to the fine princely gardens. 
and where, where they lead you through the gates, not eyes alone, but mouth and nose will gape to swallow all the beauties, follies, walks, fountains, pools, figures, strange and foreign plants, and a thousand pleasant rarities contained therein. This gives a clear impression of the self-importance and pride of the major towns and cities of the Hanseatic League. The relationship between the major cities and the local nobility was often fraught, but was at times governed by the fact that some cities enjoyed the special status of being free cities. Free, that is, from the authority of the local nobility, but yet inamely subject to the Holy Roman Empire. Their special status made them great centers for trade and traveling, partly because of a tradition of tolerance towards people from different parts of Europe and of different religious faiths and denominations. Although the city hierarchy of Hamburg was staunchly Lutheran, Roman Catholics and Jews could live and prosper there without difficulty for most of the period of the League. So most of these prosperous towns maintained professional musicians. In the High Middle Ages, there tended to be separate groups of players for civic or secular occasions and those who performed in the main churches, but often the two groups overlapped or combined. As an example, we'll look at Danzig or Gdansk. Here's a splendid engraving from 1687 of the, the main town church, St. Mary's Church. Incidentally, one of the reasons uh, that the music of Danzig, Gdansk is so little known is that the seminal study of music in the city was written by Hermann Rauschning, who was a controversial political figure in 1930s Germany, whose motivation for writing the history of the town's music was probably at least partly inspired by his political belief that the town should be considered part of Germany and not Poland. Danzig's uh, earliest records of city musicians date from the late 14th century with the trumpeters who played from the church towers of the town forming their own separate guild. But in the late 16th century, the musicians were united into one town band based around the Marienkirche. Around the middle of the 17th century, the group consisted of a kapellmeister, organist, 10 professional musicians, of which two were adult falsettists or countertenors, and 11 instrumentalists comprising two viol players, one violinist, two cornet players, and six trombonists. Most of the main town churches sought to employ temporary traveling foreign musicians as well, again, partly to keep up with the musical life of the courts, where Italians in particular were highly prized. In Danzig, we have records of the Italian violinist Carlo Farina playing at St. Mary's, this church, in 1637, including a letter written by Farina to the town council saying that uh, when I am heard playing alone in the church, please ensure that I am not hindered by the Kapellmeister. <laughs> so there's a story there. It is fitting that perhaps the single most important musical legacy of the Hanseatic League during the 17th century occurred in what was for many centuries the most important city of the League, Lübeck often called the Queen of the Hanseatic League. This legacy was the establishment of a regular series of concerts associated with the main town church, again St. Mary's. In Hamburg, we know of uh, private meetings of musicians under the title Collegium Musicum, where the latest music was performed amongst enlightened circles. But in Lübeck, uh, these non-liturgical concerts were funded by the wealth of the city and individual patrons and were public events. Indeed, few other examples of public concerts exist anywhere before this time. And the Lubick series has a decent claim to be the first modern public concert series in the sense that we understand today from, say, the City of London Festival. The story of the so-called Arbent music, evening music concerts in Lübeck uh, is a fascinating one, made tantalizing by the fact that many of the compositions sadly only survive in the form of a printed libretto. The concerts began under Franz Tunder, organist of St. Mary's, and apparently arose due to the close proximity between the church and the stock exchange, which met outdoors in the marketplace before 1673. 
Here's the view of central Lubeck today, reconstructed after the war, showing the grand St. Mary's Church, one of the highest Gothic church naves in Europe, and the marketplace to the right. This view, although a century later than the period we're concerned with, shows something of the hustle and bustle of daily life centered on the square. With this view before us, um, here's an account of the origins of the concert series from the mid 18th century Lübeck cantor uh, Kaspar Rutz, uh, translated by Carola Snyder. In former times, the citizenry, before going to the stock market, had the praiseworthy custom of assembling in St. Mary's Church. And the organist, Stunder, sometimes played something on the organ for their pleasure, to pass the time and make himself popular with the citizenry. This was well received, and several rich people, who were also lovers of music, gave him gifts. He was thus encouraged first to add a few violins, and then some singers as well, until it had become a large performance. And the 1697 Lübeck guidebook talks of the concert series under Tunza's successor, Buxtehude, with great pride and states, this happens nowhere else. Inside the church, here's one of the few old photos of the organ before its destruction in World War II on the left. Plus, on the right, a view of the reconstructed church facing east, showing the magnificent high vaulting. One of the main sponsors of Tunda's concerts was the prominent Lübeck entrepreneur, Matthäus Rodder. I promised to return to Wales in the North Atlantic, and here's our link. Since Rodder made his money both importing uh, wine from Portugal and whaling around Greenland. He was also responsible uh, for traveling with some scores of Tunda's music on a trade delegation to Stockholm, scores that survive to this day at Uppsala University, just north of the capital. Rodder became a godfather to Tunda's son, and his family also authorized the purchase of instruments. Uh, for Tunda's successor, Buxtehude, who had married uh, Tunda's daughter, as was customary when taking up the post after Tunda's death. The record states two trumpets for the embellishment of the Abend Musik, made in a special way, the likes of which have not been heard in the orchestra of any prince. Note the rivalry again. Rodder's links with Stockholm may also lie behind the great friendship that developed between Buxtehude and the Kapellmeister in Stockholm, Gustav Duben. Without Duben's collecting of works by Buxtehude, we would only have a handful of vocal pieces by him, since so few other scores survive. Uh, the Lübeck cantor Rutz, who I mentioned earlier, um, also wrote about how most of the old music in his church had been burnt or used for other purposes, and he used the memorable and faintly chilling phrase, for nothing is more useless than old music. <laughs> One of Buxtehude's most often performed vocal works, the Passion Tide cycle Membra Jesu Nostri, survives in Sweden with a personal dedication from Buxtehude to Duben. I've put a box around the top there. Um, you can see it begins Primo Viro. Um, top man or first gentleman, foremost man, primo viro Gustavo Duben, dedicated from Buxtehude. Some of uh, Buxtehude's surviving compositions have texts that uh, celebrate the city of Lübeck, uh, both in relation to its trade and its status as an, as an imperial free city. Uh, here's the text of verse 7 of Schwingt euch Himmelan, as translated by Carola Snyder. It runs, Pile rich blessing on business. Let commerce and trade increase. Let the ships move profitably. Strengthen the workers with life and peace. 
pray and moan, moan and languish, rhetorical device. Father, from your blessing-filled bosom, make Lübeck happy and great. Whilst some of the Arbeit music concerts were varied in content, others contained a single extended work, or oratorio, uh, or indeed sacred opera, as they preferred to call them. And there was no doubt who was footing the bill. A letter from Buxtehude to the town council in 1682 begins. Most honourable, greatly respected and noble, especially honoured gentlemen and esteemed patrons. To the same, I say once again, most dutiful thanks for the considerable assistance extended to me last year in compensation for the costs related to the Arbent music at that time. Two of Buxtehude's final compositions, for which only the libretti sadly survive, were performed to mark the succession of the Holy Roman Emperor in 1705 from Leopold I to Joseph I. The first entitled Castrum Doloris, or Castle of Sorrow, and the second performed the next day, Templum Honoris, Temple of Honour. These two works uh, show just how important the free imperial status was for the prosperity of Lübeck. And on the musical side, we can note that they were performed in the presence of the young Johann Sebastian Bach, who had travelled to Lübeck, especially to learn from the great Buxtehude. On the title page, you, just, uh, you can see Leopold de Ersten uh, in the middle. Uh, even more interesting is this second page in the published libretto. Now, this is a description of the, uh, the scenery, if you like, the, the, uh, the, the setting for the concert um, regarding the organ and the interior. It reads roughly as follows. Um, in an illumination on the just restored and completely gilded large organ uh, now covered uh, and uh, decorated with many lamps and lights is presented the body of the emperor in a coffin and lying in state, I think we would say. Um, at his head, the imperial coat of arms and on both sides, the Hungarian, Bohemian, and other royal coats of arms. Above this, a beautifully decorated heaven or sky over four, four palm trees with the imperial and other royal signs. Uh, kept watch over by many angels with lights. And then about the music, it says the two musical choirs, or groups, we'd say, I think, um, are uh, by the organ, uh, dressed in black, Schwarzbitzorgen, uh, the trumpets, uh, uh, trombones and trumpets with mutes, as are all the other instruments. I'm not too sure what's being described here. Uh, perhaps it's a large painting on material draped over the front of the organ, obviously well lit. But it gives some uh, indication of the effort they went to to uh, create the right scene for this particular piece. So, sadly, we have no music from this uh, piece. Um, though some of Buxtehude's earlier works do give a sense of the music heard on these great civic occasions, uh, or the urban music concerts. His Benedicam Dominum is composed in 24 parts, involving at least as many performers set out in six different groups or choirs, reflecting the presence of six balconies surrounding the west end of the church. Here's the opening of one of the trumpet parts. Again, this is a manuscript in the collection of Gustav Duben in Sweden. Performances of this piece are pretty rare, given the expense and difficulty of finding all the relevant instru uh, instruments. Uh, but Ton Copeman's opera Omnia, collected edition, obviously had no choice but to find the money. Uh, and I'll play you now the opening of his splendid recording, and you can follow the trumpet part if you like.
already covered off there. Um, what you can't particularly hear from that, of course, uh, but you can get the impression of, is the effect of using all the different balconies and the sounds coming from one balcony, then another, and then all come in together. And Booker Tehuda uses these gaps to, to enhance the rhetoric of the whole process. Now, for the final part of my talk, I'd like to return to Hamburg. The 19th century city hall in Hamburg is now, of course, a famous landmark, but the previous building was also very grand, shown here in an engraving from the mid-17th century. The main building on the right, the uh, uh, immediate uh, building on the left, is an extension that was built around this time. Uh, Buxtehude's works in praise of Lübeck have been known and performed for some time, but I have specially prepared for you today probably the first performance in modern times of a Hamburg equivalent, a piece by the principal cantor of the early 17th century in Hamburg, Thomas Zeller. A large collection of Zeller's manuscripts survives today in the Hamburg uh, City Library though very few works have been edited and performed in modern times. Many of these are written in old German tablature notation rather than in the familiar modern staff notation, including two pieces composed for civic occasions in 1654. One of these is entitled Salve Kaiser, Kaiser, uh, referring of course to the Holy Roman Emperor, and its text combines the political concerns of the city with the aspirations of its musicians in a particularly clear manner. The Latin can be uh, translated roughly as follows. Hail most invincible emperor, glory of the whole Roman world and of musicians. Hail most invincible queen of Sweden, that's Queen Christina shortly before her abdication, 1654. Um, patron of equity and wisdom. Hail, protector of the land and sea of England. So it's during the interregnum, so there's no monarch, so we know who that is. Uh, Hail, most illustrious noble lord of Belgium. Hail, fathers of the most magnificent fatherland of our most gracious lord, that's in the religious sense, I think. Hail the most prudent crown of our whole senate. Hail the patrons. Hail those who favour and promote our Lord. Lend us kindly your ears. Whether voices or musical instruments, the same spirit is in each and every one of us in praying for you and serving you rightly and performing our best for you. That's the first part of the piece. The second part has similar sentiments, including another reference to the work of musicians and the crucial relationship between musicians and those who paid their salaries. It runs, may the citizens and most honorable countrymen of our emperor live. May all live who desire well for the people of Hamburg. May all live who support and advance music and who love those who promote it. May they live, prosper, thrive and increase. Note here the prayer, not just for those that give the money, but for those who love and support those that give the money, i.e. those that create the political will for money to be spent on music. The second piece is entitled Vivat Hamburgum. Here's the opening of the piece in tablature, so you can get an idea of the style of notation. In red, you can see the title, Vivat Hamburgum. And I thought I'd explain a little bit about the notation, as it may be uh, new to some of you. The, um, the way this is written is that each note uh, is uh, indicated by its letter. Uh, and uh, the top line across the top is the the top line in the texture, if you like, and then it comes down to the base at the bottom. And the different symbols indicate uh, the length of a note and the uh, precise location of the note. Now that's the note that the first soprano begins on. Uh, the, the curved bit at the top uh, indicates that it's uh, a minim, 
And then the main part of it is the letter F. And it sits over two lines. And those two lines tell you which F it is. So it's a little bit like the Helmholtz system where middle C is indicated by C with a little dash. And the C above that, C two dashes. So F two dashes is exactly you know, an octave and a fourth above middle C. So having told you that, can you tell me what that note is? <laughs> well, the dot is a dot, so that's nice. That's a dotted minim. And the letter is a D. But you need to be familiar with old-style German uh, script to be able to deal with them all. And that one, that letter is more familiar. What's that one? Well, it's a B, but it's not quite a B, is it? It's a B flat, because, of course, H was used for B natural in German. Trick question. I think that's probably it. Oh, that's just another C again. Uh, uh, different note value, so that's a, a semi-brief. The, the, the vertical dash gives a semi-brief. And C with two lines, again, tells you which C it is. And you can see the text written along the bottom in the conventional way. It's, as a form of notation, it's an extremely efficient use of paper, as long as you don't change the texture of a piece much, uh, because uh, it just fills every space in a way that on, on staff notation you have lots of gaps. Here you can put it all quite compactly onto a page. It's very neat. Uh, and we have some music by Bach that was recently discovered, very excitingly, um, in Germany in this old form of notation. This is what Buxtehuder would have shown him, they would have talked about. Uh, we didn't know there was any uh, script of Bach in this German tablet until it was found a few years ago. So, uh, this piece, Vivet Hamburger. The text uh, is much shorter work than uh, the other one. The text runs as follows. May Hamburg, that most prosperous emporium, live. May the consuls live. May the syndics live. May the senators live. May the secretaries live. May the whole republic, church, and crown of citizens thrive, prosper, and increase. May each and every one pray this with one mouth, with a pure heart and true love. May you, O oh God, give authority to our prayer. Now, I'm very grateful to uh, a, a few singers from Cambridge and London who've kindly agreed to come along and perform this uh, for us, the first performance, I think, in modern times. Um, Catherine Harrison, Verity Bramson, Hannah Crawford, Ben Clark, Nathan Machika, and uh, Julian Liang. They're kindly going to sing uh, this piece. Uh, we promise we haven't performed it before today. We met at 5.15, and um, as sadly there's no organ in this hall, um, I had to pre-record the organ continuo part on a sound file and put it into this display. Uh, so we hope it'll work, and they'll be singing to this organ uh, track. So if you'd like to come forward. The way the piece begins is, is quite interesting because each singer sings vivat, uh, one minim after the other. Perhaps I should show you that in the tablature. Can you see that sort of vertical rising line? It starts with a bass and then each minim. Uh, so it starts, uh, yes, the bass. So you go v, 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 and then they all sing vivat together and then the piece uh, begins.
For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.